resurrection from the dead and its relation to our Lord's return. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, <clears throat> concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, we're going to start out in the Gospel of according to Isaiah, speaking about the resurrection from the dead. You don't think Isaiah had something to say about that? I'm going to show you that he does. As a matter of fact, I heard Brother Wilbur Fields was uh, digging back there in Moses and the Prophets too. But I want you to show you, I want to show you that, that these brethren back here saw some things that were very... Uh, tantalizing to their spirits. <clears throat> and this is found, of course, in Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 6. He says, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, and of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations, and he will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Now, why would you not want to draw near unto a God like this? I mean, how could Pharisees and Sadducees ever come up with a view like they had? I mean, when you have a view of a God like this, he's going to make this feast for all people. Not just the Jews only, but also for the Gentiles. Now, when we think of the resurrection of and of the gracious designs of our Heavenly Father, it ought to constrain us to have warm and loving thoughts and exceeding large thoughts of him who sent forth his Son into the world that we might live through him. Amen. Now in this mountain here, the reference is uh, to the last verse of the preceding chapter. He's talking about Mount Zion. He's talking about Jerusalem, see? Salvation is of the Jews, see? It, it proceeds forth, it has proceeded forth from the Jews, see? But it's not for the Jews only. Amen. See, we've been grafted into their olive tree. God is going to prepare a feast of fat things unto all people. Now you've got to get, get just, just think about this language. If this isn't one of your favorite texts, I hope it will be after tonight. Or if this is the first time you've come upon this text, perchance, uh, I trust that you will... Uh, do a lot of camping out here in the near future. Now way back in the prophets, God made known unto his purpose to do good unto all men, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And this feast of fat things would consist in providing for all who would receive it a blessed remedy for sins and a means of recovery from sin and that, that would be glorifying to God's holy name. And it would also amount to a complete reversal of the Edenic death sentence. That's where the resurrection comes in. 
That's the feast of fat things. Do you think the feast of fat things, brethren, is occurring in this life? Well, you may have had a, had a little taste of it from time to time, but I'll tell you the feast of fat things is, is yet to come. And you that are in Christ Jesus are going to partake of this feast of fat things. And it's not like a feast that you've been accustomed to. So you're not going to get gorged and then feel like you can't take it anymore. No, it's just like in the spirit. Against such there is no law. Amen. See, we'll just keep going on and on. And this, see, this is a worse. We'll be feasting on the knowledge of the riches of the glory of God. Amen. That's the feast of fat things, see? That's what heaven is going to be like. See, it's not, it's not just going to, it's not going to be a fun place or not just going to be a happy place, but it's, it's going to be happy because we are going to be in the presence of, of God. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. The scripture says. Now the resurrection from the dead shall bring about this glorious reversal. Doesn't seem like it can happen now. But I'm telling you, it's going to, it's going to happen. Sister Judy, it's going to happen. All of you brethren, it's going to happen. All of us have received this death sentence. It is appointed unto man once to die. But this is by no means the end of the matter. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. There shall not be one remaining vestige of the blight that death has brought upon our race in the resurrection. There will not be one trace or sniff of it, brethren. Amen. You will have completely forgot what it is like. Or what, what we will say, what is death? What, what, what is death? I mean, that's, we will just, it, it will not, me thinks it will not be part of our vocabulary in the world to come. Amen. And death and Hades shall be cast into the lake of fire. Incidentally, as the Corinthian text declares, in Christ, all shall be made alive. That's in contrast with in Adam, all die. Saint and sinner alike. I just want to touch on this for a moment, since this is talked about uh, in the church world today. Now, saints shall be made alive unto the resurrection of life, and sinners shall be made alive unto the resurrection of damnation, or the resurrection of judgment, at the same time not separated by a thousand years same time Amen. in the resurrection all shall be made to inhabit a body like unto Christ's glorious body but for the people of God their obedience to the gospel and their living by faith while they were here in this world shall have served to make them marvelously compatible with the resurrection body don't think that your faith is in vain. Your faith is not in vain, brethren. Amen. It's not merely a crutch to get you through this world. See, so you're, you're actually laying up in store for the world to come. Amen. By the use of your faith, by continuing in the faith. See, by, the, by your continuing in the faith, grounded and settled, and being not moved away from the hope of, God, of the gospel, you are, you are by that... Uh, activity and by that devoting yourself in that direction you will see or you're making for compatibility with the resurrection body Amen. now while the righteous were here they tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come and though their outward man was perishing yet their inward man was renewed day by day and for what purpose was the inward man renewed? It was renewed in anticipation of someday inhabiting a body that would be new and wonderfully compatible. Amen. It was renewed in the prospect of, ever, of never having to be renewed again. Amen. In the resurrection of the dead. And the compatibility of which we are speaking here, brethren, between the regenerated soul and the resurrection body is an essential part of the glory. Amen. 
If this is a new thought to you, then I just ask that you search it out. You check it out. Don't just take my word for it. You be as the Bereans and search the scriptures daily and see if these things be so. Now, right now, the people of God have a renewed spirit and an unregenerated body, and that makes for incompatibility. Amen. They are often heard to say with the apostle, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? How would you like to go like that? Go on like that all through eternity? Oh, no, well, you're, well, you're not, see? This is just until the resurrection. We shall have a renewed spirit and a regenerated body, and the twain shall dwell together in perfect harmonious compatibility. Amen. Now for the unchristed ones, the making alive or the resurrection shall be the induction into eternal blessedness and ecstasy, and the fullness of, the fullness of which never has been before known. For the unbelieving, the making alive, quote unquote, shall consist into the induction of shame, using Daniel's terminology, shame and everlasting contempt, and into eternal torments, owing to their inc incompatibility. See, they'll, have a, they'll have a resurrection body, but they'll have a, an unregenerated spirit, incompatibility. Amen. Now we have the first fruits of this feast of the gospel, that, that Isaiah prophesied of. <clears throat> and it's for all those who receive and believe it. We that are in Christ shall have and eat of the fullness of this feast in the resurrection. We shall be feasting throughout the ages to come. We shall be feasting on the depth both of the riches and the knowledge of God. And upon the riches of his grace. See, we just have little foretaste of them now by faith. See, we know we we. It's not like we're ignorant of them. Not, God forbid. See, we we're we're tasting of these things now. See, but there we'll taste and we'll partake without inhibition, without restriction. Amen. Now, when he speaks of aged wines and a lavish banquet. God is making appeal here to men's appetites and to particularly to their spiritual appetite. And we trust that you all have a hearty appetite for the glad tidings of the gospel and for the, the consideration of the resurrection of the dead. I hope you never wait till Easter time to think about it. Amen. I mean, there's some people, that's, about, that's just one, one time out of the year. Maybe. Wines on the lees are the best wines, the most aged wines. Similar to the occasion at the wedding of Cana, God is saving the best till last. Amen. I think we all understand that when we speak of wines and lavish meats, we're speaking in a figure. We're speaking not of drunkenness nor of gluttonous sinful excess. That's not what we're speaking about. But rather of the human spirit being abundantly and thoroughly satisfied forever by our gracious Heavenly Father and by the knowledge of Him. Amen. And when we speak of partaking of wines on the leaves, we are speaking of the legitimate leaving of worldly cares forever. Amen. And when we speak of the feast of fat things, we are speaking of partaking of the Father and Son themselves. There is nothing so transporting so blessedly satisfying, so spiritually elevating to the people of God as the excellency of the knowledge of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And this shall be our portion in the resurrection. See, that's, that's what we'll have all the time. See? Amen. God himself shall be with them. Well, let's move on ahead here. He says he will swallow up death in victory. The Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. In the resurrection of the dead is here, the resurrection of the dead is here expressed by the words swallow up death. He will swallow up death in victory. 
he will swallow up death forever. One of the other translations says. God is going to forgive, is going to give the last enemy one final dose of its own medicine. Amen. The grim reaper has been swallowing up men and women right and left from time and memorial. And death has taken men and women, boys and girls, away from the earth and from loved ones. <clears throat> And death has caused unspeakable heartache and grief. Death has gathered all men to itself and has been no respecter of persons except where God said, you can't have them. You know where that was? That was Enoch and Elijah. God said, you can't have them. He just took them directly up to be with himself. Death appears to be final and irreversible, but I stand here to proclaim to you, brethren, the blessed reality that this is not the case. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And incidentally, that coincides with the seventh trumpet in Revelation. Amen. We shall rise to die no more, and death shall suffer obsolescence. Amen. It shall be swallowed up in victory. In victory for millennia, <clears throat> death has appeared to be the victor. Century after century, death has been a universal conqueror. It has conquered the wicked, and it has conquered the righteous. It has made a thorough conquest of the unbelieving and as well the believing. It has conquered the rich, and it has conquered the poor. It has conquered the young, and it has conquered the old. Not a respecter of persons. But the time is coming when death itself shall be conquered. And all of us whom death has swallowed, all whose, those who death has swallowed up, shall someday return with rejoicing from the land of the enemy. Amen. Where death has caused injury and heartache, the resurrection will work healing and rejoicing Amen. to such an extent that the injury will be remembered no more. Amen. And where death has caused grievous separations and has separated very friends, the resurrection will reunite with everlasting joys. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Amen. Now here it says that the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. That is to say, God shall remove every cause for and source of tears, both effectually and forever. It has been well said that here we wipe tears, but there God shall wipe them away forever. Amen. Death has been the occasion of tears for every one of Adam's offspring. Tears have been frequently seen upon the faces of all, but God shall wipe them all away. Do you ever think in the resurrection body there won't be any tear ducts? And in the resurrection, there won't be any bottles to put tears in. There just won't be any need for them, see? God's very utilitarian. Amen. Well, let's move on to Hosea 13. We have to cover some ground here because uh, the time is short. <laughs> Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Now, if there's any here who would think that the grave does not have power, let them consider that the grave has issued an effectual summons to all of Adam's offspring. And unless Jesus comes again first, our bodies shall all soon be there. Amen. Overcome by the power of the grave. But let us rejoice that in Christ Jesus an abundant ransom payment has been made. Amen. 
we shall soon be released from the, crutch, the clutches of, gra of the grave and of death. Life and immortality have now been brought to light through the Gospels. See, we're not talking about pie in, pie in the sky by and by when we talk about things like this, see. When this this uh, text in, Th in, in Timothy, light and immortality, life and immortality have been brought to light through the gospel, that means that the, 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 the knowledge that has been brought by the gospel has actually brought these things within our grasp. We have a foretaste of these things, of life and immortality. Amen. See, it's we're not groping around, hoping that someday maybe we're going to be on the right track or something. No, we we are tasting of these things right now. If you're living by faith, you're tasting right now of life and immortality. Amen. The powers of the world to come. Amen. Let's move on here to uh, the Apostles' writings. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22 and verse 28. Here's the uh, Sadducees approached our Lord with this, uh, this question, and they thought they had him over a barrel. They said, therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall this woman be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, I would just put you in mind, brethren, that these these Sadducees were a step above a lot of church folk today because they, they at least had this concept in their grasp of in the resurrection. I mean, there's a lot of church people that don't even think that far. In the re now, they were speaking mockingly, to be sure, but, but nevertheless, they were, they were using this language, see? And Jesus used it too, so we know we're on the right footing here. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In the resurrection, brethren, we shall be as the angels of God. We shall be God's full-time servants. You know, like a lot of us haven't been here, able to be here at all the meetings. We would have liked to have been to all the meetings. A lot of us have come here tired and wearied and distracted. And Well, see, what, when, we're, when we're there in the resurrection, as the angels of God who serve him day and night, see, this will be something of the past. Amen. We shall be disencumbered of the male and female distinctions which are associated with this present world. And perhaps we shall also be great in power and might as the angels are now. Our bodies shall be sown in weakness, but raised in power. Amen. Now in Matthew 22 and verse 31, Jesus said, but as, while we're talking about this subject, see, and while we're talking about this subject, we'll, we'll kind of take a little side thought in here too, but this is, this is, this is some good things to think about here. He said, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I like that language, touching. I like to think of touching the resurrection of the dead. That's like an electrifying thought, see touching the resurrection of the dead, see? As the present state of the dead is a matter of touching the resurrection of the dead, let us also make the point that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. The dead in Christ are presently among the blessed company of the spirits of just men made perfect. They are absent from the body and present with the Lord. Amen. At the resurrection of the dead, their regenerated bodies will be re reunited with their resurrection bodies. Amen. 
And then in, in verse 33 here, <clears throat> when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Would God that some people would, that, that, that um, the masses of religious people, we, we need some more astonishment at this doctrine. I mean, it's, it's just, it's taken too glibly. It's taken too a matter of factly in the church world. I mean, even in fundamentalism. I mean, the only time people talk about the resurrection maybe is on Easter Sunday. And it's like, it's almost like a burden to talk about. It. See, it's really, it is. Let's move on to Mark chapter 12 and verse 23. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And then verse 25, for when they shall rise from the dead, Jesus said, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. The resurrection of the dead speaks not merely of the physical act of being raised out of the graves. And it seems like a lot of preaching on Easter Sunday, that's about, that's about all folk talk about. You know, just being raised out of the graves. Big deal. Really. If that's all there is to it, big deal. It also speaks of the bodily induction into a new life. A new and eternal order where God is. And where only righteousness dwells. Just as at our coming to Christ we were raised from the baptismal waters to walk in newness of life, we are presently given a foretaste and a specimen of the resurrection life that is to come. Amen. It is a small spe specimen, but nevertheless, it's a real one, see? Amen. The typical emphasis in the religious world at Easter time is one that is woefully short-sighted and truncated. Amen. It is a view of the resurrection that is spiritually stunted, and it is as a cake that is not turned. It is a view where the understanding of men in general is not fruitful. So what, so what, if Christ rose from the dead, if that's the end of the matter? I mean, if there, is, if there aren't any implications to that, so what? I mean, if it doesn't have any bearing on our state or our condition, what difference does it make? Really? But what I'm saying is when, when, the, when the whole counsel of God is preached, it does make a difference, and there are some very vital connections with us. The, there are vital bearings that this has on our own condition. Amen. See, and if you can see this, you will rejoice in the resurrection every day. Amen. Well, let's move on here. Luke uh, chapter 30, 20 and 35. This is the same passage, this is Luke's version. And I, we, for the shortness of time, we'll just, we won't read the whole passage. I just want to seize on this language here in verse 35 of chapter 20 of Luke. The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which are accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection of the dead shall neither marry nor are given in marriage. And I would put you in mind of the worthiness that is involved in obtaining that world. Amen. You know, in your daily prayers to the Lord, this is a good prayer to offer up. Lord, may I, may I be counted worthy to obtain that world. That's a, good, that's a good thought to conclude with. See, after you've offered up petitions to the Lord, uh, and Father, may I and this one that's uh, on my heart, be accounted worthy of obtaining that world. Amen. So you want, you, want to, you want your thoughts and your heart's affection to go frequently to that world. Yes. See? Yes. We spend too much time here. We spend too much time, we're, we're occupying too much time of concern and care here.
Only those that are worthy shall obtain. The world to come and the resurrection of the dead are, are associated with such blessedness and greatness that it will be worth whatever it costs to obtain them and to enter therein. The worthy ones will be those who have lived by faith in the Son of God while they were here, and they were not shame, ashamed to suffer shame for Christ's name. May everyone within the sound of my voice, voice be reckoned to be among the worthy ones. And may you and myself be accounted worthy to attain unto the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness and unto the resurrection of the dead. In verse 36 he says, Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are as the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. That's, if you're going to be children, that's the kind of children to be. When we are at last reckoned to be among the children of the resurrection, there will be no more question about our being the children of God. See, right now, all of you, most all of you out here are, are, the, are sons of God by faith and obedience to the gospel. But when you're out in the workaday world, not everybody... Uh, is persuaded of that. They know something's different, but maybe not everybody's convinced. But when you are the when you have become the children of the resurrection, see, there will be no question marks. Amen. There will be no question marks about who you belong to then. Amen. <clears throat> now, real quick, we'll uh, we're running out of time. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which that all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. If you have obeyed the gospel, then you have done good. If you have believed on the name of the Son of God, then you have done good in this sense. If you have lived by faith and have continued by, by faith and have not been moved away from the hope of the gospel, then you've done good in the sense that Jesus is talking about here. Amen. And you shall come forth unto the resurrection from the dead. Oh, brethren, that's a wonderful thing to contemplate, this coming forth. When we shall come forth unto the resurrection, brethren, we shall come forth. Note the words of the Savior. We shall come forth unto the resurrection of life. Much of the focus on the theme of the resurrection at Easter time in the churches is only upon the coming forth, it seems. There's, there appears to be very little understanding about what we are destined by the grace of God to come forth unto. Amen. Brethren, we shall be coming forth unto the resurrection of life. We shall be vibrantly alive unto God in the resurrection. We shall, be un, we shall untiringly serve the living God day and night in the resurrection. We shall have all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and unto a perfect man in the resurrection. We shall all have our glorified bodies and a new life in the resurrection. <clears throat> the life that we now live in the flesh leaves much to be desired. <clears throat> in the present time, we are given to lament the lament of Romans chapter 7. And if you don't know what that is, then just uh, check that out. That, that which I would, I, I do not. It's that, that constant contradiction within. Because we have a, a regenerated spirit and an unregenerated body. In the present time, we go in and out and find pasture, but not so in the resurrection. Presently, God often seems to be at a distance from us, but not so in the resurrection. Amen. Oh, and let's move on to Ephesians. We'll just skip over some of these things. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 22. 
I just want to glean a little thought from here. Now, you know, uh, there's not much talk about the Holy Spirit in the world to come. I mean, if you read in the Revelation, you can find the mentioning of the Father and the Son, the Lamb. See, you can find uh, many mentionings of the Father and the Son in particular. But I'm going to show you, in my judgment, this, here's, here's the Holy Spirit in the world to come. He says here, <clears throat> in whom ye are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, do you think that's just for this life alone? No. No, this is, we're, this is just the, the prelude, Brett. Amen. The habitation of God, this is just the prelude. See, we just have a little, like when we come together in assembly like this, this is just a little prelude, see, this is just a little taste. See, and the greater part is up ahead. This habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. Remember where God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. There is no specific mentioning of the Holy Spirit in dwelling men and women in the world to come, but here we have an insight into the continuity of the Spirit's ministry both now and reaching into the ages to come. Well, I'm, this is really going to be my last thought here because we're, uh, we've got to make room for Brother Leon here. Let's move ahead to the Revelation. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7, starting with verse 13. And one of the elders <clears throat> answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple? This is, I'm, this, see, we're talking about the resurrection state here. <clears throat> see, this is, where, this, is, this is after the first heavens and the first earth have passed away. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now back up to verse 15 here. He says, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. This is a marvelous thought. I don't know whether you've ever considered this before, but this is, this is really a marvelous consideration. This last phrase in, in verse 15 says, He that sitteth upon the throne shall dwell among them. When you think of the close proximity to him who sits upon the throne, that's really a, this is a tribute to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and to what Christ has, when he put away sins by the sacrifice of himself, see, the Lamb of God has taken away the sin of the world, and he has brought many sons unto glory, but he, what I want you to see is that he has brought them very near. I mean, this familiar, this familiar, well, this is not, this is quite a contrast from the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 6, remember, he said, uh, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. This is after the vision, after the vision of God. I'm a man of woe unto me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. But here, all of the redeemed, it says of them that he that sitteth upon the throne shall dwell among them. He'll be in their midst, not as their pal. But what, what I'm saying is he will be in very close proximity. See, our Heavenly Father and the Lamb will be in very close proximity 
to that, to that blessed redeemed multitude that shall be there in the resurrection. And I leave you with those thoughts.